The games I've enjoyed the most the past year have an interesting contrast with my real life preferences. See, in the real world, I'm not much of an adventurer. I tend to spend a lot of time within the confines of my own house rather than venturing out and experiencing what lies beyond. When I do leave the house, I plan the what, where and why of my journey. I have Google Maps on my phone, watch and car, all pointing me in the direction I need to go. With the help of technology, I can minimise the time spent on mundane tasks like shopping and instead maximise my comfort at home. The certainty and predictability offered by these tools provide a sense of security as I navigate the outside world. I appreciate having all the information at my fingertips. What will the weather be like today? Which is the fastest route to my destination? These are all questions answered easily, eliminating any uncertainty or anxiety I might feel when stepping out into the unknown. So here is my question. Why do I find myself disliking the same principle in video games? Why do I crave the opposite? Where is the beauty in getting lost? When we talk about getting lost in video games, it's important to consider the definition of the term. Looking at the definition of lost, a quick Google search gives us this. Unable to find one's way, not knowing one's whereabouts. However, when it comes to video games, I believe we can take some liberties with that definition. In good game design, even if we feel lost at times, games usually provide slight nudges in the right direction. This can be achieved through clever level design, immersive sound design, or even the use of colours and patterns that the game has taught us to gravitate towards. So, while we may experience a sense of being lost while playing games, we often find our way in the end. Getting lost is often just the beginning of the gameplay loop, leading us to overcome obstacles, solve puzzles, and ultimately find the right path forward. For me personally, what doesn't make me feel lost in a game is when it relies heavily on mini-maps and navigational UI elements like arrows or built-in GPS systems. Now don't get me wrong, games that utilise these features aren't inherently bad. In fact, many of them are great experiences. However, they do tend to sacrifice the sense of getting lost and the joy of self-discovery, which is the main focus of this video. My first point in how these games help you enjoy getting lost is when they succeed in barely holding your hand. So what truly gives me a sense of wonderlust is when a game captivates my curiosity through its immersive environment or unexpected events which offers a gentle nudge to set me on my path while leaving the journey ahead entirely in my own hands. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild embodies this sense of freedom and exploration. Quickly into the first tutorial-like area, you find you are tasked with a quest of stopping Calamity Ganon to save Hyrule, and once you leave the Great Plateau, the world opens up before you. The game allows you to confront Ganon head-on from the start if you're in a hurry, but unless you possess exceptional skill, success is unlikely. It is at that point you must embark on a personal journey of growth and development, traversing the vast landscapes of Hyrule. While the game provides a handful of main objectives, most of which are to free the four divine beasts to help you in your fight with Ganon, accomplishing these quests still doesn't guarantee you victory. It is here where the game forces you to go places it hasn't even told you to go. It is up to you, the player, to discover hidden shrines scattered throughout all of Hyrule, obtaining spirit orbs to increase your strength and abilities. With only subtle hints from NPCs, these shrines are found through the sheer joy of self-discovery. As you step out of the Shrine of Resurrection, the sight of Hyrule's expansive skyline, adorned with the perfectly placed points of interest, entices you to explore every mountain, traverse every road, and uncover every secret. The game injects this curiosity within you from the very beginning, creating a yearning for adventure into the unknown. The sheer size of distant mountains and the vastness of landscapes make them feel like uncharted territories, and initially might make Link feel small and insignificant significant in comparison to what is ahead. However, for me, as there isn't anything stopping you from going to explore, this only intensifies the sense of embarking on an extraordinary and unfamiliar journey. Recently, I played through Breath of the Wild for a second time, this time in Master Mode, a more challenging difficulty introduced through the DLC. Even though I had played a good chunk of the base game previously, I knew there were still unexplored places and hidden shrines waiting to be discovered. During this playthrough, I decided to turn off the minimap, utilising the HUD setting on Pro Mode. I found this choice made the experience even more captivating than before. Without relying on the minimap to anticipate what lay ahead, I found myself looking forward to focusing solely on my senses. What could I see and hear rather than take a peek at the minimap every other minute? This led me to embark on countless accidental detours during my journeys. I found myself acutely aware of my immediate environment, attuned to the subtle details that might hold hidden treasures. Master Mode transformed the game into more of a survival experience, where even encounters with seemingly insignificant enemies like Bokoblins could become life-threatening if unprepared. While some might find this aspect frustrating 
understandably. I embraced the challenge and dedicated myself to traversing the land with greater caution. If I spotted a group of deadly enemies blocking my path, I would take a detour, taking the unconventional route, and most of the time, this resulted in getting lost or losing my way. However, it was during these detours that I often stumbled upon the new Koroks to uncover and hidden shrines to conquer. I was constantly rewarded for just exploring and getting lost. In Breath of the Wild, what may initially appear as the unconventional route soon reveals itself to be the true essence of the game, a testament to freedom and beauty of forging your own path in an immersive and dynamic world. One of the most remarkable examples of a game that refuses to hold your hand is Outer Wilds. This game, which I must admit is probably my favourite game, transcends the boundaries of traditional gaming for me. Outer Wilds has been the subject of extensive discussion on this platform, with many recognising its incredible design. For this video, I want to focus on the unique approach this game takes to guide you and push you forward without holding your hand. I will keep this discussion about Outer Wilds as vague as possible to avoid any spoilers for those who haven't played it yet, and I am also planning a video later in the future for a deeper dive on this. Anyhow, as the developer Mobius Digital introduces Outer Wilds, they present you as the newest member of the Outer Wilds Ventures, a fledgling space program embarking on a quest for answers in a mysterious and ever-changing solar system. Apart from a thought-provoking event during the tutorial, you only have to encounter one mandatory dialogue sequence before you are free to explore. While the game may offer suggestions or intriguing hints to pique your curiosity, there are no explicit instructions like go here or complete this quest in this specific place. The game presents its vast setting and then releases you to venture into the unknown. Without any directions or map markers, your curiosity becomes the driving force that propels you forward. You know little about what lies beyond the atmosphere of your homeworld, Timber Half, so aimless exploration becomes the essence of the experience. Outer Wilds intentionally promotes minimal handholding when it comes to progressing through the game. Your progress hinges solely on your own acclimation of knowledge and understanding. There are no unlockable items or abilities to assist you in advancing, and unravelling the mysteries of Outer Wilds is solely reliant on your willingness to get lost and the revelation that accompany finding your way. Similar to Breath of the Wild when you see Hyrule Skyline as soon as you leave the Shrine of Resurrection, in Outer Wilds you just need to look up. The first time you open your eyes you see the celestial bodies moving and living across the sky. Not only are they places of interest, but these places and planets are clearly not sitting waiting for you. They chart their own course and they leave it up to you to go and explore them, creating that early sense of wonder. However, the experience of the game is not as straightforward as you being lost and then you're suddenly found. Rather, you find yourself entangled in a web of subtle hints that reward you for every exploration, regardless of where you start or which path you choose. It's these small rewards and nuggets of information that you get. It's just one of those games that you don't know when to put down. Everything about it just leaves you wanting to overturn every stone and make sure nothing is left lost. This is similar to Breath of the Wild in which you are almost guaranteed a new shrine or Korok by just aimlessly exploring. Outer Wilds thrives on this non-linear approach, making it highly unlikely that two players will ever have the same experience. This unique aspect also explains why many people enjoy watching others play Outer Wilds, as it allows them to witness the unfolding of the game through a fresh set of eyes. Personally, when I watched my wife play the game, it wasn't the satisfaction of them overcoming a challenging platformer or defeating enemies, stuff that has captivated my attention before. Instead, it was the joy of seeing where they would go and how Outer Wilds would begin to unravel for them. Each playthrough, even if it seemed they made little progress led to those little rewarding light bulb moments that enriched the experience and kept them wanting to learn more. Experiencing Outer Wilds both first hand and through my wife's playthrough were all unforgettable experiences. Being lost in this solar system and slowly finding your way is one of the most rewarding experiences I've had in video games so far. Like I have already mentioned, I'm not going to delve too deeply into Outer Wilds in this video as I believe it is a game that demands to be experienced first hand. If you haven't played it yet, I strongly urge you to set everything aside and immerse yourself in something truly extraordinary. Outer Wilds challenges conventional game design, embraces player curiosity and provides an unparalleled journey of self-discovery within its captivating universe. The third game I want to discuss is Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight starts you in the mysterious kingdom of Hollow Nest, and from the start, the path ahead appears straightforward. However, as you enter the Forgotten Crossroads, the labyrinth nature of the game unfolds. With little guidance, you're left to explore in whichever direction you choose, should you venture left or right. Which door beckons you when multiple options lie before you? This is the first moment in the game where the sensation of being lost engulfs you within this maze-like world. In true Metroidvania fashion, you encounter paths that remain inaccessible, teasing the skills and abilities that await discovery. 
discovery. How, when and where will you acquire them? The only way to move forward is through exploration. Initially, you lack a reliable sense of direction, relying solely on your memory of previously visited areas. Eventually, you stumble upon an NPC named Cornifer around the Forgotten Crossroads, a diligent cartographer working on mapping out all of Hollow Nest. For a fee, he provides you with an initial draft of an area's map, a rough sketch showcasing significant locations. This initial purchase is just a draft of all places Cornifer has seen himself, along with some iconography depicting places of interest. Yet there are uncharted passages awaiting your exploration, left blank for you to unveil and to pique your curiosity. The initial maps from Cornifer are imperfect. It's when you, the player, have explored an area and take a moment to rest at one of the benches that you update the map with your own discoveries. And even then, you only have the map to go by, as if it were a physical map in real life. Initially, there is nothing indicating where you are when you are viewing the map. There is no icon depicting your specific location. You are left to navigate this mysterious world having to be acutely aware of your surroundings, as losing your sense of location means losing your place on the map. Countless times I found myself traversing passages and sections repeatedly, seeking a way to progress. However, getting lost in Hollow Knight, just like in Breath of the Wild and Outer Wilds, you are almost always rewarded. You stumble upon new wonders that aid your abilities, encounter enemies to gather valuable in-game currency, or face challenging bosses who drop tasty rewards upon defeat. Similar to Breath of the Wild, you don't necessarily need to encounter every boss or uncover every secret in Hollow Nest. But for those like me, haunted by the fear of missing out, getting lost becomes a constant source of thrilling discoveries and also unexpected encounters, turning losing yourself to the unknown to become the main essence and enjoyment of the game. My next point in how these games help promote the feeling of getting lost is in their music. Not only the quality of the music, but how they are used in-game to maximum effect. In The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, the presence of music is few and far between, allowing it to make a profound impact when it does emerge. As you traverse the vast expanse of Hyrule, you may catch fleeting hints of a piano melody, sweeping slowly in and out of your journey. It is during the night, however, that the music can take on a contrasting tone. Around Hyrule Field at night, the familiar notes from before are similar, but sharper, creating a sense of deja vu, but with an underlying unease. The visual shift to darkness, combined with this tonal change, keeps you on edge. Although you may have felt safe in this location before, the music now disrupts your sense of security. The Hyrule Field night theme demonstrates a captivating tug of war between major and minor tones, refusing to settle into one definitive mood. This musical and certainty perfectly mirrors the essence of getting lost. It disorientates you, removing the comfortable certainty of your surroundings. The music, much like my own emotions while exploring Hyrule Field at night, never finds a comfortable place to rest. Even the other field areas, such as the desert, snow and volcano areas, have their own distinct musical compositions. These pieces feature long, drawn-out melodies that mirror the vastness of the landscape they accompany. They never seem to reach a definitive conclusion, perpetually lingering in uncertainty. It's as if the music itself self is lost, unsure where it began or where it will end. The constant motion urges you to keep moving, reminding you that these places are not meant for rest, but for survival and exploration. While you may not be truly lost in these moments, as you can see what lies ahead or you've traversed these lands before, it is only when you finally encounter something inviting, friendly and safe that you realise you are no longer wandering in the realm of uncertainty. Enter the Song of the Stables. As the gentle melody gradually fills the air, a sense of relief washes over you, signalling the presence of safety. The fading in of this music as you edge closer reassures you that you are approaching a place where you can finally rest. It is a moment where you are no longer lost. You can collect your thoughts and prepare before you venture out into the wilderness again. In these moments, when the stable song fades into existence, you feel as though you had previously been in a state of limbo, navigating through no man's land. And even though exploring the wild reaps its rewards in Koroks and shrines, hearing the unexpected melody is always a welcome feeling. The same effect extends to the village music tracks scattered throughout Hyrule, which provide a comforting and familiar backdrop for the bustling activity and sense of community found within these settlements. It is within these village and stable tracks in which you truly feel that beyond their boundaries you may never truly be somewhere familiar. This reminds me of yin and yang, the concept that opposite forces or principles are interconnected and interdependent. With this concept, you can't truly feel happiness without experiencing sadness in life. In this case, would you feel satisfaction of finding and hearing the stable song in the distance if we didn't feel unsafe and lost while hearing the music of the wild areas of Hyrule. 
Every single track within Outer Wilds is perfectly composed for the reasons they exist. Composer Andrew Prolo created these songs to be identities for things in game themselves. Outer Wilds is a game you can only experience once, but the music is our portal back into what we felt, how we felt, and to the places that matter to us in this universe. As the sun rises on Timber Half, the acoustic riff twinkles into existence, capturing the essence of the camp-like life of the Harfians. Like campers and hikers in our own world, it ignites a desire to venture out into the great outdoors. But instead of hiking, boots, your uniform is a spacesuit. Like the village or stable tracks in Breath of the Wild, this music is here to tell you that here is home. Near the start of the game, you find yourself in a museum filled with fascinating discoveries designed to pique your interest and curiosity. Similar to Lenzo's photography shop in Wind Waker, this serves as a what is out there moment, showcasing places far beyond your current location. The music in the museum is spacious and ambient, with long, drawn-out chords that create a soundscape that make you feel like you're in awe. Its slow notes compel you to slow down, appreciate and absorb everything on display here. It sparks a sense of wonder and mystery, with subtle hints of nostalgia as motifs from the Timber Half theme twinkle through. This, however, marks the transition from the happiness of Timber Half to the realisation that you pale in comparison to the vast unknown. Your fellow Harthians eagerly anticipate your exploration of these uncharted territories, and you sense that you're on the verge of getting yourself lost in the solar system. Similar to Breath of the Wild, Outer Wilds utilises moments of little to no sound to emphasise solitude. For example, as you navigate through open space in just your spacesuit, all you hear is your own breath using up your suit's oxygen supply. This reinforces the feeling of loneliness and the fragility of your situation. Your only protection against death is your spacesuit, but even that has limited fuel. If you're far from your ship, you'll hear your fuel expending, followed by your oxygen. In such moments, even if you can see distant locations, you realise that you are lost in the vast expanse of space. The silence becomes deafening, heightening your sense of isolation. These moments, which are almost silent, happen often, but you are equipped with a tool that assists in navigating the solar system. That tool is called the signal scope. This device picks up signals and sounds from across the solar system, floating alone in the void of space with nothing but your breath as company. A press of a button brings the signal scope to your hand. By pointing it in different directions, you can detect sounds and songs, songs that you will soon find soothing and songs that mostly define the essence of Outer Wilds. Each instrument has its place and purpose, contributing to the overall experience. When you lose your way or lose track of your objective, you can always find a sense of safety by using the signal scope to determine the direction from which the music resonates. I may have felt exhausted from dead ends or incorrect assumptions. Maybe I found myself in an uncomfortable place. Maybe I just felt lost. In these moments, I remembered that I could just forget my immediate situation and just point my signal scope towards the stars. The sound of a banjo melody or the whistle from a distant friend reminded me that, despite the vastness and isolation, I was never truly alone. The use of these sounds as a navigational tool leaves a lasting impression. It becomes a metaphor for finding your way in life with music when we feel lost ourselves. It's like when you're sad and you play a song to help you make you feel better, or when you wake up and the sun is shining and you play that playlist which perfectly accompanies your mood. Music can always help you along, and in the same way, the use of these sounds in Outer Wilds will forever be with me, and I listen to them in real life when I'm feeling a little lost myself. Using this mechanic instead of giving the player a map or a GPS system promotes exploration as you can only find the direction of something, not the full directions or instructions on how to get there, leaving the fun of finding your way to yourself. For the last part of this video, let us revisit Hollow Knight and its use of sound to amplify the risk and reward of player exploration. We have already discussed Cornifer, our handy cartographer who provides us with drawn maps of Hollow Nest. Not only does he provide this essential game mechanic to help us on our quest, he also provides us with something else. <laughs> Similar to the stable songs in Breath of the Wild, his melodic humming serves as a beacon of hope and a sense of direction, guiding the player towards another piece of the map. In my recent playthrough, after spending 25 minutes wandering the Forgotten Crossroads, my sense of direction began to fade, but as I heard his humming fading into existence for the first time, I knew I had succeeded. It wasn't a victory over a challenging boss, but a triumph over the feeling of being lost. By actively exploring, pushing forward and mentally mapping my progress, Cornifer's humming became my reward. As I ventured into the first truly unusual area of Hollow Nest, Fog Canyon, with its exploding jellyfish-like creatures, floating bubbles and squishy-looking eggs. The music took on a familiar yet distorted tone. The music here, if my ears are correct, is a continuation of the previous area, Green Path. 
but now it is all muddled and bass heavy as if you're listening underwater. In this new soundscape, discomfort and claustrophobia fill the air. It was in this more unsettling environment that I heard the familiar hum once again. Cornifer was nearby, offering guidance and a path forward, just as he always had. But for the first time, the hum didn't guarantee salvation. A beam of black substance blocked my way ahead. It was at this moment that I realised the power of motifs that bring comfort. They had always signalled that I was on the right track, but now, faced with false hope, I understood how much I had taken them for granted. Though I knew I was in the correct location, I had to find another way. I was lost once more, and the exploration began again. All three examples, whether it be the stable song from Breath of the Wild, Travellers from Outer Wilds, or Cornifer's Humming from Hollow Knight, they are all serving the same purpose. They are here to guide the player in a way which isn't just pointing you in the right direction or giving you a minimap to follow. They are the counterbalance to games which heavily rely on getting the player lost and rewarding them with something safe and familiar. If all these sounds change to be more minor and harsh, you might not go searching for Cornifer in Hollow Nest, and you might think twice about pointing your signal scope into the sky in Outer Wilds. But because these songs and sounds are inviting, it makes finding them and finding your way that much more enjoyable. Do I always seek to get lost in every video game I play? The answer is no. I enjoy playing most video game genres and getting lost in many of them would be a frustrating experience. This video isn't about convincing you that games centred around exploration and self-discovery are superior to those that lack these elements, but more so understanding why these mechanics in games can be such a rewarding experience, even though you may hate the same feeling in real life. I think it's just games that successfully let you wander aimlessly and make you feel like it's worth your time are some of my favourite games. Merely being open world doesn't automatically make a game appealing to me though. There are many open world games that I would have enjoyed just as much if they were more linear experiences. I feel these games I've spoken about all do similar things. They all require exploration and going off the beaten path and at the same time make it feel rewarding. The way they get you from A to B in unconventional ways also helps drive the feeling home even more. I just love how Outer Wilds leaves you subtle hints to follow and also gives you a device where you can follow sounds as an indication of what direction may be the right way. Hollow Knight forces you to aimlessly explore to unlock the luxury of having a map. Breath of the Wild is just crafted in a way where the points of interest and shrine you need to discover are scattered all across the world, meaning that you aren't punished for throwing planning and certainty into the wind and just following your feet. All the while these games have masterfully crafted soundtracks and soundscapes to enhance your experience. Are you lost in the snowfields of Hyrule? It will certainly feel that way with spacious cold trembling like ambience to accompany the area. Have you finally found corner for in a new area of hollowness that you've been struggling to get through? I'm sure we all feel that elation when hearing that sweet hum, which wouldn't be such a sweet feeling if we wouldn't have been so invitingly lost beforehand. Obviously the games I've spoken about and others like them are crafted in a way which makes getting lost just simply fun. So trying to truly answer the question of where is the beauty in getting lost, for me it's a personal one. It involves not only understanding how these games invoke and encourage the feeling of being lost, but also examining my own reactions and what these games do to me. One key realisation is that when I play these games, I can truly focus. I often struggle with attention and hyperactivity. During my working hours, I can't fully focus for too long and I struggle to keep track for large periods of time. I struggle to get myself to watch films which feel too long as I don't want to get restless halfway through and spoil it for those I'm watching it with. However, when I play a game which sets out to get me lost and rewards me for it, I find myself truly focused. I get lost in my immediate environment. I am making mental notes of where I am, where I have been and where I think I'm going. I'm attuned to the sounds around me. I'm excited to uncover what lies beyond each corner and over every mountain. By surrendering myself to the game, I forget about everything else and simply just play. Now you could argue that the same level of focus could be achieved in any game we enjoy. For example, I love puzzle games and I get the same sort of reaction from them. Put a copy of Tetris in my hand and I can concentrate for hours. But playing these games just seems to hit differently in this respect. The way they utilise music to invoke feeling of safety and direction extends beyond the confines of the games themselves. Whenever I feel anxious outside my home and need to escape, I can put on noise cancelling headphones and immerse myself in Traveller's theme from Outer Wilds. Instantly, I am transported, pointing my signal scope into the vast expanse of space, reassuring me that even though there may be distance, I'm not alone. I can play the Tarry Town theme from Breath of the Wild which instantly brings me back to the feeling of being home. If I had to live anywhere in Hyrule for real, I would choose to live in Tarry Town and I fondly recall stopping by during my journey through the Akala Highlands. These soundtracks will forever serve as a comforting refuge when I feel lost in real life. 
as a result of the same way they are utilised in the game. I often give myself a hard time in real life if I'm procrastinating and wasting precious time. I feel like I should always be doing something productive. Going off script and exploring in a video game is just that. You are diverting from the path of least resistance to your goal, but instead of the real life anxiety of wasting time on distractions, these games in particular gave me a sense of time wasted on a distraction isn't time wasted at all. And I think that this is something we easily forget in real life. Sometimes a little detour from your own goals can be an effective use of your time, even if it's just including rest and recovery. Does realising all this while writing this video change how I will act in real life? Will I stop planning my routes and planning ahead and leave certainty by the wayside? Probably not. I'm too much of a worrier to abandon these habits. However, I will make more of an effort to occasionally get lost every once in a while, embracing the uncertainty and unpredictability of life. Try to appreciate these games and what they stand for, for real. And in all aspects of life, I like to believe that it is the journey and not the destination that truly matters. It is within the journey where you would find yourself getting lost. Whether you are young and unsure of what the future holds, maybe you have a new job and you have a bad case of imposter syndrome. Maybe you just don't feel yourself right now. All I can say is, the journey won't always be easy or comfortable. But hopefully, if we can encounter enough pleasant surprises along the way, then perhaps maybe it's all worthwhile. And if you've made it this far to this destination, thank you for watching.